In the event of a terrorist attack, people quite naturally turn to the media for information. But in reporting on terrorism, are we, the journalists, not simply observers, but part of the problem? This is Roundtable with me, David Foster. Twenty-four hour news channels need feeding with news, or as some see it, non-news. There are those who think that when it comes to violence on our streets, the media actually makes matters worse by sensationalist reporting and excess coverage, which in turn creates public hysteria and possibly triggers further attacks. The mainstream media covers an attack. Those behind it make the headlines. The news cycle goes into overdrive. Viewers get the information they need, but at what cost? It's an emotional way of creating more fear, and this is exactly the goal of the terrorists. Is the media being exploited by terrorist organizations? The oxygen of publicity a term first coined by Margaret Thatcher when Britain was dealing with IRA bombings in the 1980s, depriving terrorists of airtime. But with a spike in attacks by Daesh in recent years, some media organizations are being accused of sensationalized reporting, and it's playing into the hands of attackers. He's not only looking at the location, at the time, geospatial patterns, etc. He's also looking into how much attention will I get from this attack? So the more attention the media gives, obviously, the more attractive um, it is to conduct an attack. And a new study in the US suggests there's also a growing lack of balance. It showed just 12% of terror attacks there were carried out by Muslims, but they received five times more coverage than those carried out by others and there was a 449% rise in media coverage when the perpetrator was a Muslim. It's left news organizations with a commercial conundrum. Avoid giving terror attacks too much play or face losing out on viewer numbers, the very thing they need to survive. There is a symbiotic link that someone brought up recently between finding the right balance of informing the general public, of course, but also to not let terrorist groups exploit the media by giving them the oxygen, if, if you will, um, to get the propaganda out even more. That balancing act is becoming even more important in the world of 24-hour rolling news. It's testing the credibility of media organizations like never before. And there's much at stake. They could risk unwittingly becoming a tool for the groups they set out to condemn. Well, not actually at the round table, but joining us from Perth, Australia, nonetheless, Michael Jetter, a professor of economics at the University of Western Australia. Now, he has studied what he says is a link between US media coverage of Al-Qaeda and the terrorist group's activity post 9-11. Uh, we'll talk to Michael in just a moment. On my right, Jahan Mahmood, a deradicalization advisor who believes that sensationalist, non-stop coverage does play into terrorist sounds. Also here, Richard Sandbrook, former head of BBC News, now professor of journalism, and Afzal Ashraf, a former counter-terrorism strategist for the US commanding general in Iraq. Thank you all very much indeed for coming on Roundtable. Michael, let me go to you first of all in, in Western Australia. You believe there is an actual link between coverage of terrorist attacks and further attacks. Is that right? It's not as much that I believe that's the case, um, but that's what my studies are suggesting. So. If you look at um, the coverage that terrorist groups are receiving, like Al-Qaeda, and you look at the attacks that follow in the weeks and the months after that, you see a very strong link between these two. And what my studies are suggesting is that that link is causal, in fact. So in actual fact, when we cover a terrorist attack, do you believe that we are creating the conditions for further attacks? Again, it's not that I believe that is the case. Uh, so if you analyze the numbers, that's strongly suggested in the numbers. And you can see this when you look at uh, 
other events that are happening around the world that have nothing to do with terrorism per se. And when those events are happening, then we see that terrorists are attacking significantly less, which gives us a piece of evidence that suggests that there's a causal link between how much we cover them and how much they attack as a consequence of that. Okay, Johan, let, let, let me ask you this. Uh, I saw you nodding during some of Michael's answers there. Um, why do you think this happens? Well, I think that if something is out of sight, it's out of mind. But I certainly believe that the sensationalism that is generated by the media and the inequality around terrorism. So, for instance, if a Muslim is a perpetrator, straight away his religion is mentioned. However, if he's someone that is non-Muslim, there's, you know, there's hesitancy on actually calling it out as a terrorist act. And I think that causes the disparity, the discrepancy, and that young people who might be watching who already feel part of a society that doesn't include them feel even further excluded and now vulnerable to um, radicalization. But it, it's, it's the very nature of 24-hour news that if something happens, uh, you are actually going to cover it uh, to a greater extent than before we had 24-hour news. But I think it's disproportionate. Like, for instance, the Muslim perpetrator gets so much more coverage, and the language around him is much more sensationalized. I definitely believe that to be a, a problem. And So, so we're I, radicalizing people. In I this. think we've definitely helped to do that. And the BBC... I recall in an interview in around June 2014 where I was in, in, in an interview and they played an ISIS recruitment video. Why would you play a recruitment video? You're literally giving ISIS an opportunity to recruit across the entire country. Why would you do that? Richard? Well, I think there's uh, a couple of points I, I would bring up. Firstly, um, we, we tend to talk about the media and 24-hour news as if it's one thing. And, of course, there is a, a great difference in the way different parts of the media and different channels and different media organisations approach their reporting. It's not to say that I think um, everybody gets it right. I think there's a lot that the media needs to think very hard about and, and think about doing differently. But we shouldn't just think that everybody is doing the same thing in the same way all the time because they're not. So that's one thing we need to get into a little bit. Um, um, but the second point is, um, uh, well, what is the alternative? So should we, should we censor? Should we hold back on reporting? Should we hold back on viewpoints? When I used to be responsible for running BBC News, uh, and indeed that was um, uh, following 9-11, uh, there was a big question about whether or not the BBC should carry interviews from al-Qaeda or interviews from the Taliban in Afghanistan. And my view was that they should, because I thought the West needed to hear those voices, but that, of course, they should be uh, properly challenged and probably put into context from the, the viewpoint of whatever particular channel your but do you organization you're representing. But you speculation, and that can be dangerous. I think speculation can be dangerous, yes. And I think the media does need to take greater responsibility, and I think it needs to calibrate its coverage more thoughtfully and more carefully. So, I mean, there is speculation when something happens, when a bomb goes off, when somebody shoots a number of people. You don't know immediately... Uh, what the reason is for it. It's only later that it becomes clearer, so inevitably there's going to be speculation. How do you avoid that? Well, speculation needs to be avoided in as much that you have to ask questions that are pertinent at the time. Um, and when a story unfolds, the most pertinent thing is what is happening, how to avoid danger, what is being done to um, help the victims and so on. I don't think that is the issue. It's not speculation. I think the issue, of course, is uh, to what extent uh, does the reporting uh, help the uh, terrorist and to what extent uh, can it be changed uh, so that we fulfill the legitimate need, the very necessary need for the media to report on news. You, 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 we can't censor. What we can do is understand what really drives radicalization. What really drives radicalization is a concept of success. And if the event is painted in any way as a success, i.e. they have caused terror and they are causing um, mass hysteria and so on, then that motivates further attack. If, on the other hand, uh, the coverage includes a proportionate, uh, perhaps a disproportionate um, or, uh, aspect of the fact that they are failing, in other words, a uniting people, which I think we're seeing much more recently, that uh, communities are coming together, that they haven't disrupted the, the, the country's way of life, and that they haven't changed the policies. If anything, the policies of the governments are hardening against the terrorists. That sort of message is one that will counter any n uh, publicity, positive publicity they may achieve. But it's at the expense of the Muslim community. That's the problem, well, uh, because there's unfair reporting. Like, for instance, we don't call out white terrorists. I think that's, you know? that's a legitimate point. 
uh, but I think it's a separate point to the general point that I'm making, and that is that in the event of any terrorist attack, whether it's by a so-called Muslim or non-Muslim, um, what you've got to do is to understand that they are being driven by the positive publicity of success, and our reporting has got to emphasize, so that he can balance it, the fact that they are failing. And that, I think, is an absolutely necessary thing. And uh, balance, which is what uh, um, uh, media tends to be driven by, can be um, uh, corrected by emphasizing the negative aspects of the I, attack. I, I, I agree with that to a degree. But I think if we, if we take this away from the current situation and look historically, you have to be careful because the, the perspective on terrorism changes over time. So in the 1980s, the British government called the African National Congress and Nelson Mandela terrorists. Exactly. And of course now, Nelson Mandela is seen as a great freedom fighter and a great politician for you know, human rights and emancipation. Uh, equally, uh, uh, the IRA struggle within the UK, uh, at one time there was a ban on members of the IRA or the Sinn Féin, the political party that supported them, being broadcast in the UK, which in the end was to deny this oxygen of publicity, clearly failed and had to be lifted. It failed partly because they just employed actors at the BBC to yes, do the voices was, of Jerry Adams and because, Martin McGuinness and Ed, Ed Allen just made the took, actors rather rich. Because the BBC took the view that it was important that these uh, opposition voices were heard but challenged because this was you know an important issue within the United Kingdom um, so you know I, th I think perspectives and, and of course we now had a peace deal in Northern Ireland so perspectives on terrorism change over time and therefore I'm slightly anxious that we say we need to put a particular framework and perspective on it and stick to that at the moment because can these can will change to, over time. Go to Australia uh, and Michael once again the point made by Afzal here is quite an interesting one isn't it um, first of all you give them publicity and thereby perhaps encourage further attacks. But if you report on the fact that the country is united in the wake of a terrorist attack, you actually um, stop them achieving the objective they want. It, it's a paradox, isn't it? Because in reporting one, you, you, you report the other. Yeah, I mean, I certainly I agree with most what I've heard just now. So I think that's a very interesting discussion. Um, so what, what I would also agree with is that I don't think we should go to um, thinking about censoring or some sort of regulations. But I think what would be much more uh, beneficial and fruitful is to have a discussion about how could we adjust reporting on terrorism so that we don't play exactly in the hands of terrorists. Now, in terms of do, do we know whether terrorists want the public, uh, the, the coverage of the media, that we know for a fact. So, for example, Osama bin Laden has been quoted saying what, what our fighters cannot achieve, the media will do for us. So, so we know that those organizations want the coverage. Now, the question is how, as journalists, could we could you prevent them from being abused or being used by the terrorists for their purposes? And I think one step in the right direction would be um, um, to take a step back if an alleged attack happens and think about what do we really need to cover and what is just uh, a degree of sensationalism. For example, if you interview uh, the parents, the brothers, the sisters and the entire family of the perpetrator, is that really necessary? Do you really need to give them um, that, that sort of coverage and that sort of platform to be portrayed as some sort of a hero of some marginalized group. So I think what, what I find quite interesting in this context is if you look at other areas where journalists have found a way to report that does not cause negative consequences. And to me, one interesting field to look at is if you look at reporting on suicides. Um, so journalists know very well that you don't report suicides on the front page. You don't describe uh, the, the, the person who committed suicide in detail because you don't want to encourage copycats. And for, for some reason or another, within the media world, it has, this has become sort of a, an unwritten rule. And what I would propose is that we go toward discussing how can we create an awareness amongst journalists that goes in that direction, that we know we don't want to cover it too much and we don't want to cover it to an extent that plays exactly in their hands. Jahan, yes, I saw you nodding again uh, as Michael was making his point. What I want to ask you is um, what would you say to Richard or others who were in his position, were he still to head of BBC News, the, to try and change things for the I better? Think, I think to put things in context and to ensure that young people feel part of a country, not for them to feel excluded, because most of the young Muslims that I've met certainly who, t who tend to be in the kind of more vulnerable category, if you want to call it that, um, don't feel part of society. And it's almost like 
we want Muslims to integrate, but at the same time we're kind of segregating them by having this kind of narrative that makes them feel not part of a country. And the best way around it is to change some of the terminology, I think, and also to acknowledge that most Muslims are actually victims of terrorism, both abroad and at home. Why are they always expected to condemn something that they have nothing to do with? If anything, I can recall the number of protests against Iraq. In The initial one was led by a majority white British community, but then it, um, in, as a, as a follow-up, there were so many Muslims saying, look, please, let's not go to Iraq. So I think they, are, they want to be uh, part of this, the, the overall British society, but the language that we use around terrorism it is often exclusively used well, give, about give, give Muslims. Us an example. You know, for instance, the word terrorist. Before we even know who it's committed by, we jump to this idea that it has to be Al-Qaeda, it has to be ISIS, it's got to be a British Muslim, it just can't be anyone else. And there's a record of this, like for instance, Thomas Mayer, who killed um, Joe, Cox. Joe Cox, right? I mean, the media failed to acknowledge him as a terrorist. Then there was Damon Smith, the potential two-bomber. They didn't use the word terrorist for him. They have done for Anders Brevik. And then for the guy who killed Mohammed Salim, a pensioner in Birmingham, they used it for him. His name was um, Pavlo, uh, oh, I forgot, like, Lapshin, okay? He was a Ukrainian student. Um, and then there was Zach Davis, who, who had Nazi symbolry in his house. He was inspired by Jihadi John, and um, he, he tried to hack a Sikh dentist to but death. There, but they there, didn't there are these conversations though, but in newsrooms every mm. single day. I've been part of these conversations. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. And I think, I think that absolutely the media, and including my view, the BBC, needs to be far more thoughtful and calibrated in the way it uses its language. Actually, the BBC traditionally has got into a lot of trouble for trying to use the, the term terrorism uh, very judiciously and tries to avoid using it. It uses it when other people use the term. It tries to stop using it itself. It's actually relaxed that slightly under an awful lot of political and, and other kinds of uh, social pressure, I think, although by and large I would say it's still it's more judicious in its use of the term than other parts of the media. And we, we, we but I, I completely agree that we need to be more consistent about the use of what we label as terror and what we don't uh, and, and understand that it's not about whether somebody is Muslim or not. It's about the motivation for what they're doing uh, and the effect and impact of what they're doing regardless of where they come from. We, we often wait until we are able to say police are describing it as a terrorist attack uh, but rather than simply saying it is a terrorist but, attack. Well, yeah, and I, th I think that's fine uh, because if the police are describing it as a terrorist attack that is the legal process or that is probably the legislation that's going to be used um, and I think the point that uh, we're all agreeing on is that um, you cannot be inconsistent in the way you do it. The point I think we need to come back to is the one that you made earlier about perspectives change. Um, I don't know if, if I misunderstood it, but it's a potentially dangerous thing. What we're saying, if we take that view, is that, well, we might think that Daesh or Al-Qaeda might be acceptable in the future. When the two examples you gave of the South African example, um, you know, he actually um, decided that terrorism was against his values. He went against terrorism. There is no um, uh, s study that I know of that links the fact that Jerry Adams and uh, Marty McGuinness were able to speak on BBC to the, f the peace process. What did happen was a peace process came about simply because both sides accepted they couldn't defeat each other militarily and, and stuff went on in the background outside the view of, uh, of the media for a very long time. So I think we need to be very careful about those examples. We do need, I believe, to understand that uh, the, the study that's been done quantifies what most people have been saying for decades. There is a link between what the media says uh, and terrorist uh, decisions to act. They act particularly to grab the media headlines. And we have the only way we can balance the positive um, impact that these people get through radicalization, etc., is to highlight their failures, highlight the fact that they have failed. They might have succeeded in killing people, but they've failed to divide society, they've failed to change government policy, they've failed to constrain our way of life. Until you do that, you do not achieve that. Let's, let's ask Richard what, it, what he tells his trainee journalists right now, because it's a different world to the one that you and I grew up in mm. as, as mm. young reporters. 
Well, well what, I, what I tell them is uh, not to fall for what I would call the sensationalist trap. And I think one of the problems that many parts of the media are dealing with at the minute is it's hyper-competitive, uh, and therefore they tend to overreach, and particularly at moments of breaking news. We see this on 24-hour news channels. Organisations overreach, they speculate, they assert when they don't really know. So what I teach is to separate evidence uh, attribution, careful attribution from opinion uh, and from analysis and be very clear about what an organization knows, how it knows it, where it knows it's from and separate that from assertions, opinion and, and analysis. We saw with the um, Boston Marathon bombing a number of the American news organizations went wrong because they asserted the identity of, you know, of what they thought the, uh, the bombers were and was completely wrong. Channel 4 News in this country fell into the same trap with the Westminster bombing. They, because of chatter on social media, they named somebody who, an individual who was not the bomber. So, you know, what, what I teach is you've got to be very careful, very sober, do evidence-based reporting and be completely transparent about how you know and what you know and, crucially, what you don't know. Well, let me throw this one out there. Um, if that is what Richard's telling his journalists and, and they follow it, all well and good. But you end up in an atmosphere in a newsroom where competition is the most important thing, where it's, it's can I, vital. Can I just butt in there? I've had a personal problem with journalists coming in and ultimately trying to create a situation where they induce a particular answer. I can give you one prime example when I was working with young people in Birmingham. They had a piece that went out of young girls actually critiquing and criticizing the Taliban for not allowing women to, and girls to go to school, for instance. However, they didn't quite get young boys or young men in this case giving the other side of the perspective. And because they didn't, they were now trying to induce an argument that would literally get these young people to say that the Taliban actually aren't so bad. When you get journalists coming out into the community who have agendas to try and present both sides of the arguments, they can't find young people to say what they want to say, and then they try and create the atmosphere and the answers. That's highly dangerous, that's highly irresponsible, and I haven't seen that once, by but, but the way. This is sort of what I was trying to get at when I was so politely interrupted. It, it, in the real world, <laughs> it doesn't work the way that you would like it to always. Well, I think it needs to work that way more often. I would, certainly wouldn't defend that, and you know, why would anybody would defend that kind of coverage? Um, but I do think that one of the things that's happened in recent years, particularly with 24-hour news channels, is this conflation of news and opinion and speculation uh, and we need to try and work out ways to separate that out again because actually news organizations fall flat on their faces frequently when they try to do that and they overreach and sooner or later that pays off in terms of trust and reputation and everything else. Um, you know, there are a lot of examples of bad journalism around the world, there's no question about that. It doesn't mean to say that every news organization uh, uh, is guilty of them. I think um, you know the conflation of new, uh, facts, opinion and speculation I think is a, is, is a legitimate point of concern. But I think we've got to come back to this business of balance. And one of the big problems is that the media, in the interest, well-meaning interest of providing balance, gets a, a, once an argument where you have the majority view and some very minority uh, extremist to come along and present that view. You have then an equal platform for what is a very minority extreme view yep. with a majority view. Uh, how do you achieve balance in that context? And this is what people like, um, uh, you know... Um, uh, it would be lovely <laughs> to continue <laughs> the conversation forever and ever, but uh, we're running out of time on the programme. Before we end, I want to get back to, to Michael. Uh, listening to what you've heard from um, this end of the conversation, are you encouraged by attitudes or in the real world are we all going to go back to what we... Uh, our baser instincts. Um, I mean, I, I'm encouraged by the fact that we're that journalists are now talking actively about how we should cover terrorism, whether we should change uh, something along those lines. So I think that's a good sign. Um, I quite welcomed last year Le, Le Monde in France's effort to not mention the names, for example, of terrorists anymore, not show their photos. So I think that's quite good. Now, now, just in terms of so, so um, if you look if you look at the data, the the pure facts that are out there, then since 9/11. Al-Qaeda has gotten more coverage on U.S. television than China and Russia combined. Now, if you think about, and you know, people are still saying, that, well, you know, the media are just reporting what the people want to see, but very clearly, Al-Qaeda has very, has a lot less, um, bears a lot less importance for the U.S. public and for the world in that sense than China and Russia, for example. So we know that uh, coverage is, is a lot and it's likely too big. So I think the question is how can we how can we get it down? And I very much welcome a discussion about how can we do that. Okay. And I very much agree with what has been said earlier that 
we should we should stick to you know sober facts, especially in the hours and days right after an attack. And I think that's very important. And I think to not uh, overreach Johan, I mean, and the very fact that we're having this conversation much. is a healthy thing. Yeah, it's great. I just um, I'd like to see it across all the different um, mainstream media yep. agencies. Now it's great to yes, start it so. here. Let's see it elsewhere. I think one of the things is that the media, most of the media is not a public service, it's a commercial business. And the fact is, and they're struggling in a competitive time, they would do whatever is going to drive eyeballs and drive income for them. And the problem is, how do we get a bit more of the public interest back into mainstream yeah, public journalism? public interest journalism. Does it exist anymore? Well, I think it does in, in some of the, the major um, outlets. BBC has, still has a brilliant reputation abroad. And it was hard for one by sticking primarily to the facts and we mustn't allow competition to uh, deteriorate that uh, hard-won reputation thank you. and I think most uh, media uh, outlets will understand that. Thank you from Perth in Australia Michael thank you very much indeed thank you to all of you at the table here today a case for balanced and sober reporting of attacks something uh, I can assure you that I for one do think about when covering events like that. Worrying about it, though, is one thing. Doing something about it, another. Yet that, as well as delivering the news, is very much part of our job. From me, David Foster, and the Roundtable team, thanks for watching. Hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.